Right, I'd just like to introduce Chris Jim from Brainstorm Lee from Foster, who's going to talk about the latest Harry Potter movies. All right. Thanks for sticking around. Um, we are running a bit late, but um, I hope you're, you're not too exhausted. Um, I'm just going to run through um, the impact of the Harry Potter movies on the film industry, specifically, of course, um, in regards to our company and uh, <coughs> the achievements and challenges that we've faced throughout the last 10 years. Um, is, there, is there a way we can dim the lights? I'm just going to start, start off um, with our company um, showreel. So, um, just give you an idea who we are, what we do. So yes, that's, um, that's our showreel, and there's of course a lot more stuff on there, and I'm, I'm sure you've um, probably seen most of the movies that are on there. Um, it's kind of a montage of all, all those things that we've done in the 
I don't know, I would say last three years or so. Um, just going to go through um, a couple of things, uh, general frames to introduction, then I'm going to go through the Harry Potter movies, challenges and achievements, then um, I hope afterwards we're going to have a little bit of time for question and answers. So um, for those of you who don't know Framestore, we are London based. We have op offices in, in London, in Iceland and in New York. Um, New York is mostly dealing with commercials. Um, in London we're doing commercials, design work and visual effects for film. Iceland is doing mostly um, commercials and effects work in conjunction with us. Um, and overall we have about 25 years of um, film and visual effects experience. Um, we fluctuate around 500 to 600 um, employees, um, depending on the project load. And we are mostly known for our creature animation. And I think um, this is just a you know extract of uh, our biggest milestones in, in creature animation. There was a children of men, screaming baby. You know the stuff that where visual effects step in where. You know, you can't film those kind of scenes you know, on set, and, you know. And um, we've ever since progressed and, you know, uh, developed our um, creature pipeline more and more. And the Harry Potter movies uh, from 2001 on uh, always helped us and uh, uh, let us develop our, our assets more. Um, and we, we ended, ended basically with Deathly Hallows part one and two, well in part one we did Dobby and Creature, which I think is our, our biggest creature achievement at the moment. Um, so well, how did we get there? Um, ten years of working on the Harry Potter movies. I didn't get a chance to work on all of them, but um, um, I think no one did because they were so popular in the company that you know you have to be, you get to do one or maybe two, and I was lucky to get to do the last two. Um, it was 2001 when um, we got the foot in the door. Um, our visual effects supervisor, Rob Duncan, um, we didn't know what the Harry Potter merchandise was going to be. It was a series of books. It was, you know, no one really knew how they were going to take off. So we got the foot in the door doing some train environments, some cloud effects, um, the magic blood. And then I was reading through the press release um, about the first, first one 10 years ago and uh, the train environment, um, you know, it, it, when you read back the press release 10 years later, and it's like, they make it sound so exciting. And then there's foreground plates, studio against blue screen, background plates, uh, shot in Scotland on the truck. Um, it's pretty, today it's pretty standard stuff, but back, back in the day, 10 years ago, it kind of said back projection wasn't enough for the, um, for the audience anymore. We need to do a perspective warp in the inferno. And, it sounds funny, but it's only 10 years ago that those things were, were really quite difficult to do. You know, the Flame and Inferno were only able to handle large amounts of, of data and, and stuff. And the cloud effects we did uh, um, from three still frames, we generated a massive amount of 150 frames. And then 10 years later, you're talking about minutes and minutes and minutes of our avatar, two and a half hours of full CG movies. So it's come a long way. Um, software development has come a long way. Um, Chamber of Secrets um, then was substantially more work for us. Um, so we did the Basilisk and the Cornish Pixies. Um, it, was a, it was a big sign of trust from the studio for us to, to get a much larger chunk of, of work, two substantial sequences. Um, they were intercut at that point. Um, again, you would do this completely CG today. Back like eight years or nine years ago, you would intercut it with uh, animatronics. Um, but what they found out on set was the the, ballist, the the big snake in the Chamber of Secrets is such a huge animatronic that it didn't, you know, the animatronics hydraulics didn't work quite work as well. So we actually got more and more work um, while we were working on it because they had more and more faith in us. Um, the Prisoner of Azkaban, um, different visual effects supervisor on our side. Uh, we did the Hippogriff. Um, it's about 80 shots in the movie, and uh, one of the biggest things there it wasn't it wasn't just the visual effects element placed placed in the shot. It was actually slight interaction with uh, with the actors. Um, 
we started to do photorealistic feathers and fur. And um, one of the challenges for the hippogriff was that it was originally a character um, um, who had lots of dialogue. But then um, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the movie, they decided not to give him any dialogue at all, yet he was playing quite a substantial amount of uh, character in the movie. So we had to um, bring character into, the, um, into, a, into, a, into a creature with a beat that didn't talk. So that was a big challenge for our animation department. And there were some quite close-up shots, um, which you might see later in the, in the montage, of the hippogriff interacting with the, with the actors. So um, 2004, that was still a really, really big challenge. Um, the Goblet of Fire was another um, big step forward for us. We were approached to do the underwater sequence. And um, that was something that uh, has never really been um, done before. It was a fully CG um, water environment that um, had partial green screen actors. So most of it, though, was completely CG. Um, I was um, talking to Tim the other day and like, asking about um, the, the achievements there. And he said, well, I don't think anyone has you know, ever done that before at that stage. It was about um, 200 shots in six minutes of the movie, so that was a big achievement. Again, lots of underwater creatures, plants, uh, um, digital doubles for, for Harry and, and the actors. Um, then we had a little bit of a dip, I think. Oh, no, not this one, not, not Order of the Phoenix. Uh, Order of the Phoenix, we did, um, for the first time, we did one of the house elves. Um, Dobby had appeared in Potter 2, I think, for the first time. Creature was then in Potter 4, um, where we got the chance to do our first uh, humanoid creature. And we did the uh, centaurs, which were a combination of, of humanoid uh, creatures with a, with a horse body. So that led us to do develop a, a muscle system, a skin system. And um, again, com combining, like, creature, he's a house elf, but yet he's, you know, he's, he's, he's uh, a biped and he's quite, quite human in, in that sense. So it's, it's, you know, we got from, from creatures, from animals, to more and more sophisticated um, work. Um, we developed a fully muscle-based facial system, facial rig for, for creature, so we could um, make, at that point, the most believable animation that we were able to do. And then we also started going into cloth simulations and all these kind of things, like four years ago, that was kind of a given that you have to do these, yet they were still very, very difficult because um, most of our software is um, out of the box. Uh, not, not out of the box, it, it is, um, we, we of course use Maya and, 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 and you can uh, uh, PR men as renderers, but we develop and script most of our um, tools ourselves. So we have our own muscle system, we have our own um, cloth system. Um, of course, we, we always use the things where they're useful. For example, um, Encloth and Maya is doing a really, really good job, and we actually used it in the last Potter. Um, for Half Blood Prince, we had a little bit of a dip. We only did um, very little contribution, I think five shots only. Um, we did a CG fork. However, we had done that before, but that was over, over a year ago before that. And to a certain degree, only doing five shots for a big production um, can, be, can be sometimes more tricky than, than doing a major sequence because you, you can't account, like you can't account for major development time and everything. So within that year, software had changed, like um, operating systems had changed. So resurrecting that creature that we had done a year before was actually quite challenging for you know those five shots. And then we got our our biggest um, challenge, I think, where we actually um, stole Dobby from ILM. Um, we went into a pitch with the client, and they were, you know, they were expecting to see the creature that we'd done before, that was creature, and we presented Dobby, and we basically took took the uh, took the model and did a test, and. Uh, 
Christian months, uh, I think it was about two years ago when we approached the client. It must have been three years ago now when we approached the client. Um, he went in there and um, Pablo Morello, our animation supervisor, did a really, really good presentation and we ended up getting Dobby and Creature, which was really, really good for us because they were interacting in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the script as well and it, it would have been somewhat of a logistical nightmare because there were lots of shots where Dobby and Creature were in one sequence. So um, it was good for us. We did um, wand effects for the first time, which is not super exciting, but um, um, that was combined with the apparate effects uh, as well. The main challenge for us internally was how, how do we progress, where, where, how do we go forward? We have done the creature before, of course, four years later, you had to look much, much better and had to be much better developed. So we, of course, had done shows in between where we had um, skin development, creature development, and fur development, and muscle systems for, um, for example, for, for Narnia, we did the lion, this, you know, those, those systems still apply and those, those concepts still apply. Um, yet, uh, Dobby and Creature were a huge, huge animation task because we didn't use any motion capture at all. Um, we just used facial reference. Um, because we didn't, um, we didn't feel that a human being could um, could represent a tiny elf in, in its movements and in its, in its character. We had, of course, uh, plates where Dobby and Creature were acted out by, by Toby Jones and um, um, the other guy whose name I forgot. And um, so that was good, really good reference for us, and it was allowed the actors to to interact with with creatures that weren't there but um, we didn't use any, any motion capture. So before we actually started um, rendering or compositing any of this, we did about 12 months, one year of development, how we're gonna do these creatures. And uh, it, was, um, it was such a big undertaking that we wanted, we wanted it to do really, really well, of course, as well. Um, but we basically um, rewritten all our muscle system, all our, our skin systems, because you know technology evolves, and once you've finished one system, you know a year later something else is out there, and you can use um, uh, more computing power. And our render farm was growing, so we had more um, abilities to do subsurface scatterings on skins and, and all those kind of things. Um, the last um, Deathly Hallows Part Two. Um, Andy Kind was actually the CG supervisor on the part one, and then became visual effects supervisor on the last part. But we did a fully CG chamber of secrets environment. So for movie two, chamber of secrets, they actually had built a whole set, and that was all practical um, for, for the for book seven B. Um, that actually had was all CG because they didn't want to spend the cost again to rebuild the whole set. Um, we did a fully CG World of Horcrux and fully CG King's Cross environment. And that kind of shows you that, you know, from where we started, so some background replacement 10 years ago, um, to substantial sequences uh, in the movie that had to be fully CG, and the expectations these days are it has to be almost photoreal. So the expectations from the client were very high. Um, I, I don't think we are 100% there yet. I think. For everyone professional in the industry, you can still spot the non-photo reel from the, from the CG, um, but um, we're getting very close. The other big challenge on the last movie was the, the water. We, hadn't, we, have done, we had done waves and, and water simulations before, and water effects before, but in this case, the water horcrux had to be directable. It, has, it had to have a character. It was what water was so like, um, lunging after. Hermione and Ron in the Chamber of Secrets, so we had to kind of have, have a realistic water simulation, yet it had to do what we wanted it to do. So that was, that was really, really, really challenging um, and caused a lot of headaches and um, a lot of data as well. I, I remember one shot, it wasn't even that long, but one shot caused overnight 16 terabytes of data. Just like a guy from systems called me like, your disk is full, it's like it can't be. And it's like, yes it is, like there's the shot, yes, 16 terabytes. And it's like, um, like 
you know, if you think back 10 years, 16 terabytes, that was, you know, that was our whole system, and now that was just one shot. So things have evolved um, quite a bit. And actually, I think one of the nicest bits was that we actually got to do the last sequence and the last shot in the movie. It's not a very exciting shot. It's, it's 19 years later in King's Cross, and it's, you know, it's a background replacement. Um, but still, it was quite nice for us to, to, do, to be involved from start to finish and actually have the last shot in the, in this, in the, in the merchandise. Um, so as I said, challenges and achievements. Each movie, I think, brought, um, brought its own challenges with it. But for us, being a creature house, um, the challenges were always, always to do a better creature, next time a better creature. So we went through, you know, the, the hippogriff, the centaurs, and creature, and then we went to Dobby and creature. So we got a foot in the door. Um, we got more and more um, pipeline. We uh, developed more and more systems um, that allowed us to do not just animals, but also humanoid and creatures and uh, simulations and um, rendering capacities these days allowed us to do proper skin renders. So this is kind of a little bit of an overview of, of the stuff. On the bottom left you see a reference of you know, the, the ballistic animatronic, and then uh, top left you see the hippogriff, you know, and then the underwater sequence, and then the top right, uh, on the right hand side you see creature, how he looks in the, in the fourth Harry Potter. And I grabbed two early screen grabs, so Harry Potter 2 and 4, and I must admit they're particularly bad screen grabs as well, but that's where we were um, eight and six years respectively. And um, if you fade through where, where we are now, um, it's quite a big difference, and you, you don't realize because you, um, when we did the test for Dobby and presented it to the client in the pitch, um, we thought that looked amazing already, which is somewhere in between here and the, and the previous slide. But you look back and it's like, what, that, that sold the pitch? I was like, okay, but it's only because within a year you can, you can um, achieve so many things and technology evolves so quickly. And I would like to talk a little bit about the, the general creature pipeline and um, development, and I'm gonna base it on Dobby and Creature mostly because that's basically where, where we have landed now. And um, of course, a lot of the stuff that came out of those movies is now reused in, in digital doubles. And uh, in, you know, we did Captain America, facial rigs. Um, we did Red Skull, which was supposed to be a prosthetic cleanup. But once you saw the plates, you knew it was going to be almost full CG head because they wanted a skull, which was you know cutting away skin and all these kind of things. So um, these days, you just you can't get away with prosthetics and cleanup anymore. So we ended up doing um, applying all, all those te te uh, techniques that we had there into into other shows, of course. So at the top, you can see um, a shop pipeline it goes from tracking to animation, simulation, and then render, and then you comp the whole thing together, make it look beautiful. On the asset pipeline, um, if you have one asset, um, I'm going to call it creature and Dobby an asset in, in this case. Um, they go through modeling, they go through rigging, they go through look depth, and then um, you combine the two, basically, um, the shot pipeline, the amount of shots, and the nature of the shots defines kind of what the asset pipeline needs to do. If you have close-up shots of a, of a human eye being, you want a proper facial rig, you want to pay attention to skin wrinkles and um, subtle eye movements, eyeballs, head, can't be spherical, they have to be the exact um, anatomic shape. So all that influences each other. Um, but at the end of the day, if you approach it that way, you have different components for, for each asset. So you have a puppet, you have a face, you have a body, and you have cloth on top of it. Um, out of those components, the, the, the rig has, a lot, has to be so flexible that you can do a previous with it, you can do animation with it, and you can actually render it. So in order to, to turn around quick shots and you know, block out the sequence, you need a previous, uh, previous rig. Then you need to be able to animate once it's been blocked out, where you, know, you don't like, 
you don't block out every every hand movement or every step yet. But um, yet again, once the director is happy with the timing and what's going on where they are, where they are on the shot, you have to be able to animate that, and you don't want to redo that all the time again. So you have to be have to have a flexible rig that allows you to do that. And um, I just want to throw in a a little play blast of um, what Dobby's rigs uh, looks like. And uh, on the right hand side, you can see a little bit of how we pay attention to the comparison between the humanoid and uh, the elves. But basically, um, the, the puppet rig on, on the left hand side, those were the controls for the animators. Um, and you can, based on what you were doing, if you were pre previous or animating, or if you were ready for render, basically, you could enable and disable controls. So in this case, um, this is an, an animation example, but those are the things that the animators had to deal with. And on top of that, um, we had um, Dobby as a model. We had to rig a skull that was mainly for, for rendering, because with introducing subsurface scatter, you don't, of course, don't want any subsurface scattering coming through the back of the head. So you have to have block out objects inside. And of course, as I said, six, eight years ago, so you, wouldn't, you wouldn't go quite that far. You would try to fudge it. But these days, rendering power has become um, quite cheap. So global illumination, subsurface scattering, all those kind of things are getting feasible to use in feature films and to use in feature films close-ups. So you don't have to cheat as much anymore. Underneath there, um, we, we wrote our own muscle system. It's, um, it's a surface-based muscle system, because that way we didn't have to worry about too much. We started off on Creature actually doing a proper muscle system, like separating out all the muscles. Um, throughout, the, throughout the years, um, our rigging department developed this surface base, which is, um, um, avoids twisting of, of the muscle with, with each other, so you don't have to pay too much attention to when you animate something that you have to avoid collisions which are, you know, where muscles would go through each other and stuff like that. So this is all highly scripted and um, I'd be lying if I, if I said I understand everything of it, but um, really, really sophisticated system which allows us basically to put together an animation of the skeleton which then drives the muscle system, which then drives the fat layer, which then drives the skin. So here's an example um, of what I was just talking about, is the, the surfacing of, uh, and twisting of skin. So we um, introduced um, the muscle system. On top of that, you have the skin and the surface topology of the, of the CG creature, which then still has to be driven by other components. So these, these are workouts that, that we do for, for creatures to see where the problem areas are, where, you know, where, where the skin is behaving correctly. Um, it's, a, it's a really, really complicated system. And um, as I said, we didn't use any, any um, motion capture. However, we used a lot of facial reference. And so there are certain expressions um, which are actually on the, the guy doing all the the, the funny faces, that's our animation supervisor. And on the bottom left, you can see that's, that's him doing the, the facial workout. And on the, on the grayscale image next to him, that's a CG model doing the same thing. It's, it's, a, it's a MOBA system, it's a UV paint that motion captures the facial expressions, the skin. Yet we never used any of this um, to actually <coughs> animate, to actually drive the animation of it. It was more for for reference and for us to find out like what can we get out of um, UV paint these days. So um, we then um, develop um, the facial rig more and more and more. And you can see, I've just, just put in a workout. You can see that the animators have to have all the control that, um, that you have in a certain expression. So, you can see there's, there's so many controls. And some of them, you know, if you look at the controls that are moving, like the, the circles and triangles, they're not that many. But, um, so it's a combination of actual, um, of actual blend shapes, it's uh, displacement um, supporting, 
and um, as you can see in the coronicular ring here, even that, so it's all rigged and simulated. So it's all a bit of a combination that we, um, if I go back here, sorry. it's a combination that the animator has um, the most amount of control that he needs, but has to deal with the least um, um, tools. So it, basically when he, when he closes his eye, he doesn't have to worry about the eyeball and the knees and then just intersect, intersecting. So all those um, are highly complicated rigs and some simulations and scripted. And you can see um, how the skin slides over the, you know, the, the eyeball and then even the, the inner eye um, coronicular ring um, drives some of the skin. And here you can see how skin's, you know, sliding over the virtual bone. Um, it's uh, a highly, highly. I, I think it's really, really interesting. I just don't know enough about it to, um, to be able to write those things myself. But um, the guys have done such an amazing job. And of course, you, you can't, you can't, um, you can't uh, script it so well that it's you know, re re reflecting reality yet. But um, it's all achieved. But we're getting so and so, um, so much closer to, um, to be able to do those kind of things. And, um, we just um, do workouts with these creatures that have nothing to do with, with the shots itself. Of course, for us, we knew the urban creature had to be that big on screen, so we needed all that control, we needed all that detail. Um, so there, you know, there you start off with facial expressions, then you, you, do, um, you do a rig that in workouts that show what influences what. So basically here, he's animated, but you can see um, um, in the in the rest of the in the rest of the face, what's going on? So even though the eyes are animated, his eyelids are moving, his eyebrows are moving, the the little bits of pieces left and right of the nose are moving. So that's that's not animated, it's not hand animated. Those are simulated and, and rigged. So um, we have all these expressions we go through and make sure that the character works before we go into actual shot production. And another big thing for us is, I think one of the hardest things to do, we found, is, is the eyes anyway, because you are trying to establish a character and he's so, so humanoid that as an audience you instantly look into someone's eyes and you kind of know what, what they're feeling, you know how, how they're, you know, how they're acting, how they you know, what their inner character is. And we paid a lot of attention to eyes, we, um, Dobby in the second movie had really, really big comical eyes and we actually worked with Tim Burke, the visual effects supervisor on, on, the, on the client side. Can we, change, can we make changes to the eyes, make them a little bit smaller, make them more sympathetic? And um, um, here you can see that we, having the eyelids fold out underneath um, its own skin, that was one of the hardest things to do because you don't want to be able to like, have to hand animate all of this. We took lots of reference and looked at tons of pictures and you know filmed ourselves and filmed employees and you know close-ups and uh, trying to make this skin workouts um, as believable as we could. And on top of that, we um, we introduced a system. It's not. It's nothing. This is nothing too high tech. It's just um, a compression map. So it shows you where topology uh, of the of the character. Um, compresses and, and stretches, which allows us um, in compositing, for example, to drive color corrections. So when he was pressing the lips together, we could just animate, uh, could use these these maps to um, like color correct the lips to be a little bit pale and um, like the, like basically subtleties in you know wherever you in, in your facial workout, um, you lose, you press out a little bit of blood, so you, you, your skin color changes slightly. It's of course most apparent in the in the lips. Then um, talked a little bit about simulation already, but um, so we had on the left hand side we had the skeleton, then we had the muscle system, and then we had a, a fat layer basically, which was running on top. It's like this little layer of fat in between the muscles and the skin that was then again yet influencing the behavior of the skin. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure you can see it a little bit. It's a bit hard to see. But all these um, combinations of, of rigging and simulations allow you to actually create somewhat of a believable behavior of, 
of, of movement of a character and then the skin on top of it. So as I said, we spent 12 months developing this before we went into actual shot production. Of course, everything was a little bit based on to what we needed to do. And we, we had we were blocking our sequences at the same time, but um, the rigging department was um, fully concentrating on just making the physics of this character work. And here you can see um, the animation animation puppet, um, not rendered, just in comparison to, to Dobby Jones. And uh, these are the underlying uh, rigs, basically. You can see the fat layer, and uh, you can see that's happening, what's happening in, in his neck area. And this is the, the final render then. So you have, when he talks, you don't have to animate it. His lips and his, his cheeks are slightly vibrating. And his ears are moving and, you know, it's a, it's a quite unique character in itself. And at one point, you know, there are funny accidents that happen all the time. So sometimes when something goes wrong, you know, at one point his nose just got really loose. So his simulation was just dangling around. <laughs> it's quite funny. Um, we used, um, my, actually my end class I said, you know, um, we use stuff out of the box where we can. So you can see in this sequence where Harry is holding uh, Dobby when he's dying. Um, in order to get the interaction working of his hand and the neck and uh, her closing the eyes, the eyelids, the eyelids slightly, like when you touch your eyes, the eyelids very easily move over your eyes. So we used a system there to, to create the wrinkles of him holding, um, like wrinkling up the skin and um, her interaction with the her interaction with the, with the eyelids. So in the final render, it looks something like this. So those are the things that you can do these days um, in a close-up um, scenario. Animation, um, as I said, um, on the left-hand side, you will be able to see um, the blocking animation rig um, that basically was used to just Block out, block out the shot. So you would start there, then tweak the animation, find like once the director had signed off on it, you could then on the right hand side, that automatically um, comes comes out, out of there. It's prior to cloth simulation and, and skin simulation, but Still, it gives, gives the director a very good idea of, of what the performance is going to be. And again, we had reference for everything, sometimes in shot, sometimes um, as, as the studio takes. So that was the Bible for us. Of course, you can. Um, has no master. Different angles. Dobby is a free actor. And Dobby has come to save Harry Potter and his friends. So we used a lot of witness cameras, and like when we had the chance to um, do it in the studio, um, capture from different angles, and really putting the performance of the actor into that CG character. Um, another voice reference here um, for Creature, and I think this one is one of the um, most kind of freaky shots because you, see, you look at you look at them together. And it wasn't so much for the animation to to copy; it was more trying to capture the the character of, of what was being portrayed. Portrayed, but the the lip licking in this shot is one of the things that you know the animation director liked. You know that's that's what he would do. You know, so um, just take that up. And you can see creature was. Um, a tiny bit more difficult because he had um, much smaller eyes, which means they were even more human than Dobby. Dobby still kind of buy as an elephant, as a non-human creature, but a creature itself had so so similar eyes to a human that you know when we didn't get it right, um, we it always looked wrong and it always looked a bit freaky. There's this thing called the uncanny valley. It's um, when you um, 
the audience, as human being, responds to a, a CG creature quite well, a character which is stylized and not, not human, so you know, anything like Toy Story or you know, that, those kind of things are very sympathetic because you know it's, it's a cartoon, it's, you know, it, it is supposed to be that way. But the closer you get to being more human, um, the audience tends to freak out when it's human but not quite, so it gets a bit freaky. So in order to, like, to overcome that, like, you have to like, um, really, really push the envelope um, to, to maintain the sympathy with the audience because you don't want to create something that's just somewhat, somewhat wrong and it just becomes very, very um, freakishly to watch. Um, I want to end this with a um, Q&A, but before I do that, um, I'm going to have a montage, which actually we have just for a staff presentation. It's a bit, it's a bit um, funny, but it has basically all the work for the last 10 years that we did. Um, I hope you enjoy it. It was here, in this house.
Anyone have any questions? Yeah? Why do you guys choose to As I said before, I think the, the challenge with um, the elves was they were humanoid, but they were not human enough to actually use motion capture. And we're using motion capture, we actually have our own motion capture stage wherever we can because it is you know, it's a huge benefit, but usually we combine the two. But um, the, the anatomy of um, Dobby and Creature as house elves compared to a human being didn't quite fit and it, wouldn't, it didn't allow um, the animation director to have that, that amount of control that he wanted. And um, we figured that if we did motion capture and if we, we applied the motion capture, we would have to do so much cleanup to, or modification to the animation anyway that we decided to not do it, basically. Do you think you'll, um, do you think you'll have a look back um, and criticize this? Oh, yes, I already, I, I already am. <laughs> it's, No, but even even now we are um, we are exploring new rendering techniques already, and um, I think guess it looks very good. But we're already looking back on it and, and think, well, this could you know there's certain things that could be better, and um, you know especially I think when it comes to simulation, and we we were you know we were struggling a little bit with the with the rigging and simulation department because they were quite happy when you know things were driven by something else and he was like oh look look you know he's closing his eye and his right ear is moving okay, yeah but it shouldn't you know so they, there's, there's something and you can always make it better because human beings are so so subtle and i think the elves um, as an audience to allow you to be far far enough away from a human being i think if you were to make it a human being um, you'd still see the flaws in it. And um, I, I'm, I'm still, you know, there's so much still to do to, to make it photoreal, I think. Um, I think everyone is really, really proud of the work that we've done. And, you know, looking back at the first version of Creature, we thought that was amazing. Um, four years later, you, you compare the two and you say, oh, it's actually not quite as amazing. And I think it is, it is that progression. You are, and you, the visual effects get more and more sophisticated throughout, you know. If you look at what Avatar did, um, I think you're going to look back in 10 years into Avatar and think, oh, that looks quite cartoony. Whereas when you saw it, it was, it was just really, really, really cool. And we worked on it, and it was, it was amazing. And, you know, if you compare what's going on in Transformers these days, um, it's incredible. But if you compare that to something that's been going on 10 years ago. So I think it will always evolve. Like you can never, you know, um, luckily he doesn't have any, he doesn't have much hair. So, you know, you can always work on things that make it, that make it better. And we, we were working on, I think, on the eyes for about three months. Not just, not just the coloring and the modeling of it, but there's so much going on in the human eye, um, expression-wise and character-wise, that even like when you, when you, when you talk to someone, you instantly see the, their reaction, even though they don't express it. But you know, if someone's watering up the eyes or something, that, that is so, and those things are really, really, really hard to do, and still, you know, would, would be a challenge. And you know, we, I think we we did really, really well, and and um, I'm very, very proud. I think in, in about five years' time, we will look back at it and it's like, oh, look, we, what we can do today. Yeah. And on projects for Framestore, um, we're actually quite um, fortunate at the moment with two very, very big projects. Um, one of them is um, called Gravity. It's um, directed by Alfonso Cuaron. It's one of the directors of the Harry Potter movies as well, um, where we are doing, let's say, 98 of, of, the, whole, of the whole production. Um, it's, a, it's a movie, I have to restrain myself to... <laughs> What I, what I can say. Um, it's a movie that's taking place uh, in space. And um, we were involved from basically from the storyboard point. Um, the art department was involved in concept art, and we were involved in the whole shoot, in the previous thing. We, we previewed the whole movie. And it's a very, very big project that's going to keep us busy until the end of next year. Um, we're doing 
a upcoming movie with Keanu Reeves, 47 Ronin, it's a samurai movie, um, which has a lot of creature work for us as well, um, coming out at the end of next year. We just finished um, work on Sherlock Holmes. I think actually tomorrow we'll have to deliver the last three shots, but that, that's out of the, uh, out of the way. Um, we've just done finished work on Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. But um, there is like gravity in 47 Ronin that's going to keep us very busy for a long time. Yes, we, as I said, we use, we use Maya, of course, for, for most of the stuff, and we use you know, um, out-of-the-box plugins like Ncloth where we can, but um, that, that, that rig that allows the skin to interact with the muscle system and with, and with the pet layer, that is all, that's our, own, um, our own proprietary software that, that we wrote as plugins, basically, and we have some very, very clever guys who can, can, write, can write these softwares, but it's all based on around Maya and, and things. Mm -hmm. We used, um, in the scene where Harry is holding Dobby, um, we used the, the skin system to, to drive all the animation and everything uh, here. But actually this part we kind of cut out and made a plus system. So we, we retract his hand and then um, used end cloth to simulate how, how the, his hand would influence the top of the skin. Because our skin system is not made to do that and to interact with other objects. Any more questions? Hmm? We use Linux. Um, um, our art department uses Mac OS, but our whole company is based around Linux um, purely because uh, it's open source and allows you to, to write a lot more plugins and, and code for ourselves and to streamline our own pipeline, basically. So. Um, in order to to get all this done and rendered, um, you have to have an optimized system somehow, not just for the user to work with, but also to get it through the render farms. We, um, for the last Harry Potter, the water simulations, um, that was also delivered in stereo, so we had to make two renders, but the simulations took 24 gigs of RAM, so like some, some frames we couldn't render, so we had to optimize. So our system has to be as, as lean as possible, basically. Yeah. Do you guys do all your compositing for like Harry Potter in the mm -hmm. Do you use all of this like Flame and Smoke and Nicole? Um our commercial department still uses um, Flame, but they've they've started using Nuke. Frame store used to use Shake up until mm -hmm. I'd say three years ago. Now all the compositing is done in Nuke and we've developed quite a lot of tools for it as well. Um, again it allows like it allows us to Streamline workflow between 3D and, um, uh, and and compositing in a way that once you get a render, you don't have to bring in um, all the passes separately because we do a lot of compositing. We get all the passes split out, like um, different category lights and diffuse. We get subsurface scattering separately to reflections and specula. So um, Nuke allows us um, a whole bunch of um, Python scripting that we can use to. Basically, once a render is rendered and published, um, we can then just have a node to say, pick up the latest render of this, and allows you, it builds the shader tree for you and recreates the image. Um, otherwise, you will have hundreds and hundreds of read nodes. Um, uh, I remember on Avatar, we had so many layers, because everything was CG, we had um, so many layers that we had um, 3,500 nodes in one script. And um, if you try to manage that, Manually, you will just get lost. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.